Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show and I feel so privileged every week I get to talk to smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies and organizations ranging from Netflix to Kinko's to YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table. Go check out our archives because there's so many great episodes back there, so much great learnings. I'm also the co-founder of Rise 25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And this is part of our top agency leader series where we have been profiling various different top agency leaders and thought leaders sharing their wisdom about this vital area of the economy. And our guest this week, first, I want to give a shout out to Carl Smith of Bureau of Digital, who uh, is responsible for connecting me to our guest. And our guest is Steve Parks. He's led creative and digital agencies for over 16 years. Before that, he was a journalist for the BBC in London. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And he now helps agency leaders to work on their business as confidently and effectively as they work in it through his writing, speaking, and training. He has been named one of the most inspiring agency leaders in the UK by a French press survey of over 2,000 of his peers. And now he's also editor of Agency Radar and CEO Convivio, which is a consultancy working with agency leaders. Of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Dundry Podcasts and content marketing. And if you're listening to this podcast and you've ever thought, you know, should I do a podcast? Well, I've been doing one for 11 years and I tell everyone that they should do it as well. And, and Steve, you recently started a podcast, right? So you, how, how are you enjoying doing yeah. it? Yeah, uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. I first, my first stint at podcasting was between 2004 and 2010. Whoa, and very early For the days. last 10, yeah. For, I remember for the first thing, we were doing some corporate podcasts in one of my agencies. Uh, it was a production agency. Uh, and we were preloading some of the audio onto the early iPods um to mail them out to, wow. <laughs> to clients of a client um and then yeah regular podcasts that would update on them from there but i remember that early thing of you know how do we explain to people how to download these things and how to sync it and you know you used to have to connect the podcast you know player with a cable and download the episodes onto it, it was it's all so much difficult. easier now so yeah, so yeah. difficult back then yes yes much easier these days to consume them so that's great. Well, welcome back to the fold. You were an early adopter and you're you're back. I'm glad to hear that. So if you want to learn more yeah. about that, you can go to our website at rise25media.com. All right, Steve, um, such a pleasure to have you. You got this great background. You were a journalist for many years with the BBC. And I'm constantly, you know, perhaps I guess because um, I was raised by a journalist, my dad was a journalist. And so, uh, and also the industry has changed so dramatically over the last 20 years or so with the adoption of the internet. Um, Talk a little bit about some of the the highs and lows of, of being a journalist. You you met presidents and you met astronauts and trained as a rally driver and prime ministers. You had some amazing experiences. Yeah, I think that's the fantastic thing about being a journalist really is those experiences. You Somehow being a journalist gets you access to the kinds of places that you wouldn't normally get to go. And that is the most fun, seeing behind the scenes of things. So remembering some of my favourite times, um, one of them I was storming uh, buildings with armed police. Um, it was part of their training. It was a big old disused hospital. And there I was with all of these guys in black with the big helmets, the big guns uh, and everything. And we were storming this building, rushing up the staircases um, and things like that. That was, you know, absolutely fascinating to see behind the scenes there. For another series, um, I trained to be a rally driver. Um, and uh, so I had to actually get behind the wheel and be taught over a series of weeks how to actually drive around an off-road rally course uh, so that I would be able to A, survive and B, get a slightly respectable time. Um, and it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling all the way through. So it's those kind of experiences. But then, yes, also the people that you get to meet, the kind of people that you get to interview. And a bit 
bit like you were saying with your podcast that you get to interview agency leaders and you get to download that knowledge. And, and I found the same with being a journalist. I could meet such a diverse range of people and you'd get to download a little bit of their brain every time. And it was, it was brilliant. Yeah. And tell, talk a little bit about uh, how that practice of doing interviews, um, high stakes interviews, and and getting the information that you need in in a concise way and then conveying it how that relates to the the work that you've done as an agency owner and now agency thought leader and trainer and speaker yeah it was a fantastic training ground actually um, because in terms of being a journalist you're learning about asking all of the right questions you're learning to be a 15 minute expert you know before you go and do an interview or before you go on air and suddenly a guest is plonked in front of you in the studio and you have to ask them you know relatively intelligent things at least um then you have to spend 15 minutes before the program just brushing up on them on the subject you're going to be talking about because you're going to need to ask you know highly relevant pertinent questions that are going to get to the nub of the matter um and and be seen to be knowledgeable, but also in the case of politicians or other leaders, hold them to account to some degree. And so you need the knowledge to be able to do that. So you quickly learn to be able to research and absorb information uh, in a very speedy way. And that's been tremendously useful for me. But you also learn to write and communicate in a concise and punchy way. And that as an agency leader, that is just gold. Uh, I think that's one of the most valuable things. Now, one of the interesting things you did when you started your agency after you left journalism was you believed in crazy transparency. These are your words, uh, even showing the clients the budget and the margin and the profit that you're making not, not, and, and your team as well, which I'm sure that there are going to be other agency leaders listening to this or break out into hives just with, uh, at the thought of that. So talk a little bit about why you made that decision and how you made it work. Yeah, um, I kind of, uh, it wasn't in my first, well, in my first agency, I learned about the value of that by not having done it. And then I did it from the second agency. So in the first agency, uh, which ran for you know quite a number of years and was successful for a long time, and then hit the uh, 2008 financial crash head on with you know some of the big clients that were the UK's biggest banks, um, <laughs> which was not the best time really. Um, so uh, in that business, I you end up when you hit a crisis then having stored up all of these things that are bad news to have to discuss with people and bad news that you have to think about as a management team, as an entire team or with shareholders. Um, and it's much better not to have that in the back of your head and be thinking, oh God, I really hope I can fix situation X before person Y finds out about it. And I see a lot of ag agencies having that relationship with their clients where it is, crikey, this has gone wrong or we're behind on that. I hope we can sort it out before the client finds out because if they do, I'll have to have a difficult conversation. And what I found is that it's much better earlier on just to be really open and transparent about everything uh, in you know ridiculous ways. So we've started uh, when we were an agency, we started pitches to clients with, look, here's what we think the risks are of this project. This is the stuff that could go wrong. Now we're going to look at where you could go and how you can mitigate these risks and manage it with a good process and the right kind of talent on the project in order to deliver the best results. Now, you know, agency school wouldn't teach you to start the client thinking about risks, but we regularly won pitches with very large organizations, you know, national governments and so on, uh, by connecting with them where they were like, finally, an agency understands what we have to think about as a large client. We have to make these justifications in our business cases and so on. And you answered it head on. That was fantastic. Then you showed us what we could hope for. So we, we talk about risk very openly and problems, but we also are very open about the numbers 
Um, so within a project, there is literally nothing that a client couldn't see. And that did, as you said, include project budgets. Uh, I once had a, a call uh, in the evening from a client in a bit of a panic saying, Steve, Steve, I thought I'd better uh, ring you really urgently because I've just been looking around the project documents and I accidentally clicked on something. I don't know how it happened, but I got to see your budget for the project. <laughs> and I don't think I should be allowed to see that. So, you know, I thought you'd better know so you can change a setting. And I was able to say to him, look, don't worry. Remember, we talked about radical transparency. Well, this is radical transparency. Go ahead and look. OK, you so let me, okay? let me ask an obvious follow up question on that. Sure. So how, what's to prevent the client from being like, no, 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 you're making too much margin on this. You know, we, we want to cut that in half. Uh, well, um, they then have to deal with the fact that we don't want to work with them. <laughs> and what you want to do as an agency is get yourself into a position where the client knows they really want to work with you because of a specialism you have or particular people you have within the team or methodologies you have. And they, ne they know they need to work with you. And they know that because you're good and you deliver and you've got this track record that you're worth the money and then you don't get those gripes so much. Um, whereas if you're running a more commodity type business, then yes, people are always slicing the margin, always looking, you know, I can get a can of beans, 1p cheaper over here, can you match that? Uh, so you want to be selling not cans of beans, you want to be selling unique expertise in a way that people feel scared that if, if you go away, they'll be stuck. Um, and then they don't quibble on things like that. Then they look at it and go, whoa, you're doing quite well, aren't you? Oh, I can see why, <laughs> see, see why you're uh, growing as a business and that sort of thing. But they're pleased for you and they respect it because you know, what, you know, they realize why they're paying the money. Yeah, <clears throat> makes sense. Um... I want to ask you about after a new client signs on with an agency, you know, there's, there's always a little bit of buyer's remorse whenever anyone spends money on, on something substantial. And, you know, that any friction that happens along the way can, can lead into more buyer's remorse, like if it doesn't go smoothly. Um, but you have something you call the magic document that helps with mag mapping out the user journey. Talk, tell us a little bit about what that is. Yeah, it's something that we did at an early stage. We tried to use our own techniques on ourselves as an agency a lot. Um, and we were, we were doing sort of in large complex projects for national governments. Um, and we needed to be doing lots of service design for these. They were very big, complex things. So we applied service design principles to the way that our agency ran and the way that our clients would experience that. So we treated our clients as the users for us, and we mapped out the whole user experience of their journey with us. So we would be looking at, you know, from the first time that they had some contact with us at an event or through our content online or something like that, the first time there was person to person contact the first time we pitched for something um, and so on and we looked at where we were strong where we were weak where there might be worries where the clients had stresses and worries and we did identify exactly what you said there we identified this kind of um, valley of buyer's remorse in that whole satisfaction thing which is you know that if you do go in and you are quite a um, an expensive or high value agency, there is that thing when a client, uh, you know, we know it ourselves, we've gone out and bought an expensive hi-fi system. We then get at home and go, oh, should I really have bought that expensive hi-fi system? Or should I have saved the money or bought a cheaper one or whatever? So there's that period of doubt. And that is when you absolutely, as an agency, uh, that is the most critical time. Um, it sets up the entire project if you give a client a lot of reassurance and support in that period so that they can see, oh, no, wow, that is a really good hi-fi system. Listen to that. Um, so what we decided to do in that was we mapped out what are all the things that give them some kind of pain in those first few days or weeks of engaging with us. And one of the things that gave them a lot of pain was, for example, their internal procurement and legal and so on processes. So we worked with a few clients we'd, we'd built long relationships with and we looked into what they typically had to do. And we then just prepared a really simple three page document that goes out with a client in response to their email that says, fantastic, you've been selected. 
we send them straight back a great news we're really looking forward to it here's everything you need to know to get us set up on your procurement systems and it maps to the fields of common systems this is the field for this this is what you need to know about us here's our bank account details here is our tax number here is this and just a whole load of that in the document and um, it seemed to us like a really simple thing. That was just going to be one of those small nudges to improve that experience. But I still have a client who procured from us in 2015 and I occasionally go for pints with. And he will still from time to time say, you know, I was just telling so and so the other day about your document. <laughs> mm. And, you know, he's spreading the word and telling people about this thing and telling other agencies they should do the same. So things that can seem really small can actually make quite a big difference to the experience for the client. Because it kind of smooths over the, yeah, the experience. I want to ask you also. So, you know, I, I know that um, through your agency, you worked with, you know, some big companies like MTV, Comedy Central, selling large projects, hundreds of thousands of pounds, um, you know, in, and you've got this background in journalism, which I'm kind of fascinated by people that shift careers. And, you know, in journalism, you know, I think it's fair to say you're not doing sales in, in the, the B2B sense. So to be able to shift from that into doing sales, especially on a high level, selling very large projects is, you know, not always easy. A lot of people struggle with it. So, but, but you say that you see sales as like a form of journalism. So talk a little bit about how, how you view that. Yeah, it's one of those things that when I first started a business, you know, because I'd always wanted to start a business ever since school careers advisor, I told the careers advisor, I either want to work for the BBC or run my own business. And they'd laughed and <laughs> that's the thing, but I'd held it in my mind. And so when the time came to sort of leave and start my first business, uh, I was excited, but I was also a bit scared because one of the things at the BBC is it is a, a public service broadcaster. So there is no such thing as sales. There is no, there's no advertising to sell. There's nothing like that. There is a tax that goes to the BBC and then the BBC allocates the money internally. And there were ridiculous things like I was producing a, a program and I wanted to know, I had ambitions to do a series of outside broadcasts and so on. And I asked my boss, a uh, senior guy, can you tell me what's the budget for this year for the show so that I can plan out? And he says, I can't tell you the budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? Well, you'd only go and spend it. <laughs> and things like that. So money was just this taboo subject. Okay. Um, and so sales, you know, money and nothing was part of that. So I felt launching into a business, I was, you know, incredibly ill-equipped to do this. I had no sales experience, nothing. And uh, so I figured, well, okay, uh, you don't have to be, you can't pretend to be something you're not. So I'm just going to approach running a business with the skills that I have and what I know. And I figured out uh, later on that there is this thing called consultative selling. Um, and that's essentially what I ended up doing. Because I was a journalist, I would go meet people, I would ask them lots of questions, find out lots of interesting things. And having asked lots of other people interesting questions elsewhere, I'd be able to see the patterns and the stories that emerged and tell those stories back to the latest people that were asking me questions as, have you sort of thought about this and the way this connects with that and you could do this? And they thought it was miraculous. And then they would say, well, tell you what, you've got to come in and do this for us. Okay, sure. Um, and so that was the sales process. We did very little that you would recognize as sort of true sales. I am a terrible kind of schmoozer, deal maker, closer, all that sort of thing. That's just not my style. I just go out there, help people as much as possible, uh, be human and normal. Um, and once people can see how helpful you can be, then they want more of it and they go, great, how can we get your agency involved? And so it was consultative sell. And sometimes it takes longer. There was one project that took over a year to turn from being invited in to, you know, talk to them about some stuff to actually buying a thing. Um, but it creates a much better relationship. It creates a relationship where you're going in as an equal to them, not as a kind of, you know, servile company who will do whatever they're told. Uh, they bring you in for expertise and so on. So I found it really valuable learning that lesson and approaching sales, not as a, here's a thing, do you want to buy a thing? 
but hey, what are you doing about so-and-so and how does that work? And have you thought about this? And I saw so-and-so doing it over here. And let me tell you a story about that. That worked a dream. Yeah, yeah. I, I can totally relate to what you said because I a similar kind of experience. I was a uh, you know, worked in, in politics as a speechwriter and putting together a speech is like putting together a story. And um, you know, for me, once I realized that sales was more about being consultative and giving people advice and being yourself, not trying to be someone you're not, you know, that's when um it became a lot easier. So I, I can totally relate to that. I want to ask you about Wonder Group. Wonder Group was an agency that was the result of four different uh, companies, I think, coming together. I think you had 12 different owners and four directors that were running it. Is that right? The t- tell me a little bit about the, how, it, how it came together. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's, um, that's both one of the most exciting things, but also one of the biggest regrets I have is the Wonder Group. Um, and uh, it was we merged together four different agencies across Europe. We were aware that um, a, a large organizations were seeking to buy open source digital solutions, were seeking more sort of uh, you know, uh, consultancy and support for those. Um, but large organizations were expecting to deal with larger organizations than just a 10 person shop. Um, and so we looked around Europe at, you know, particular agencies with particular technology and the technology was Drupal at that stage. Um, and we built relationships with a number of agencies between ourselves and then essentially merged together as four equals uh, within a large agency that created uh, a much bigger agency that grew eventually to be 170 people in nine countries um, and was a terrific success for a while. But um, I learned a lot in that period and have a lot of regrets because being one of the owners and one of the directors, um, seeing then the way that people who have the, the different cultures and the different experiences and different experiences of running a business, when a business suddenly becomes very successful and the pound or euro signs start dialing up, as soon as it starts getting to be quite big numbers, people can go a little bit funny. Um, and when we were building up something that was good, it was clicking with clients, staff were loving working there. There was an amazing culture evolving. It was profitable. It was successful and was on a good, good growth path. Suddenly, business partners started thinking, oh, do you know what? I could have a nice skiing house somewhere or I could have a Porsche 4x4 or, you know, things like that. And um, it's just that little bit of sort of greed built in. And and they then look at this golden goose that's laying these golden eggs. And you think, they think, well, hang on, the golden eggs have been great. Imagine what we could get if we killed the golden goose. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, and, that, and that's what they do. And that, so that's when people turn to, hey, let's sell this thing. We could make a load of money. Now, you and I and lots of other people listening will know that selling an agency, particularly of that sort of size, uh, should be to be effective and to get the best value and to protect the value that's there, be at least a sort of two year process uh, or more. You need a period of time first where you're shaping the business up for sale because Preparing a business to sell is very different to growing a business. With growing a business, you're not looking to maximize the profitability all the time. You're looking to gain market share. You're looking to invest and grow, open new offices, and it can be expensive. And that's the road we've been on and we're, we're successful on. Um, whereas if you decide to sell, which can be a valid decision by shareholders, then you need a period of, right, let's really look at our processes, get everything in place. Let's make sure the management structures are there. Uh, let's make sure the profitability is as high as we can possibly make it so that, that multiple really has an effect. Uh, and you do all of those things over a kind of a longer period. And then you uh, actually go about a sort of dating process of finding potential buyers. And you, you know, set them off and you look for an auction to be going on and uh, lots of excitement and things like that. Whereas what happened instead was um, some of the shareholders thought, hey, my mate works in corporate finance, says we could make 20 million euros. Let's do it. Um, and they sent a document out and they, you know, they said, well, let's not. There were a few of us that ran the business at that point. And we you know whether business people were running it and others were developers and designers and so on in the business um, uh, who had been there since the start. And um, they just they knew that the businessy ones wouldn't uh, agree with it. So they just sent out a document 
government <laughs> oh. through their corporate finance, mate. And it's things like that. And, you know, there was just a whole irresponsible mismanagement. Um, and it was it was a real shame to see because everyone involved was good people. Um, nobody had particular malice uh, involved. There was just that sort of, you know, Euro signs cycling through their eyes like in a cartoon. So, and that's, so, that's sad. So in mm. retrospect, what could you have done differently in order to prevent that kind of outcome? Is it just choosing different partners? Is it having a better partnership agreement in place? What, 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 would, what would you have done differently? Funny enough, I've been working on exactly that this week and thinking about that because we're, we're trying to essentially build up this framework for how people who lead agencies can think in those you know, upper hats within the business as a shareholder, as a director, as the CEO. And you know, we as leaders often inhabit all those three roles at the same time. And so how do we do the right things in each of those? And I think in our shareholder hats, um, what I've learned from that and what I've seen multiple times from consulting with other agencies is it's so easy for shareholder owner disputes to flare up just from misunderstandings or misaligned objectives or hopes or fears. Um, and so I think what needs to happen is every year there needs to be a formal shareholder retreat where it's not just a, oh, hey, haven't we done well? Let's have a few beers. Let's decide how much to give ourselves as dividends and so on. Um, and instead of treating a business like a cash machine like that, just how much can we take out this year? Treat it as an investment and treat it like your portfolio and look at the performance. And do we want to continue to invest in this business? Do we want others to invest? And you have these discussions and the shareholders then need to give a commitment to the company. And there should be a written um, document you know, separate to the shareholders agreement, this is a written mandate between the owners and the business about I'm continuing to keep my investment in the business because I want either you to maximize the value of the business over this period, or I want dividends of this percentage per year, or I want, you know, this kind of pride in, that the organization is achieving X, Y, and Z. You know, so there are reasons why people own businesses. So let's get those right to the surface. Let's make these very transparent between the, the owners and the company. And let's have that agreement on a rolling three-year basis so that then if a shareholder does go, oh, my mate says we could get 20 million euros if we sell this, let's do it now. The thing is, well, no, we've made a three-year commitment that we're owning this. So it's now this year's meeting. So we're, it's a rolling three-year commitment. So we can make a plan for in two years time. So we can say in this year's three year document, okay, for the next two years we're owning this, but in year three, we want to sell it. So management, your role now is to maximize the profitability. You've got to put in place all the processes, make sure due diligence will go very smoothly. You've got to get management teams in place everywhere that will stay with the business when the owners exit. Um, all those things that drive up the value can be done over that you know responsible two-year period and then in year three there can be the dating and so on uh, and it can be planned and structured so what you've got then is a ceo and a board who have always got that at least two-year horizon to what uh, what they're going to be doing as a business and what the uh, strategic priorities of the business are i think that's really key and yeah. then if you see that there's differences you can work those out then in discussion rather than them coming up later on and flaring up. That's great. Um, yeah, another thing that you've uh, spoken about is, you know, you said that a lot of founders and owners, they kind of panic when their overhead hits a point, like a million in overhead. Uh, I think you're referring to that maybe on an annual basis. Um, what can they do about that? Yeah, no, I, my reference was on a monthly basis. Actually. It was, uh, you basis, know, okay. um, once your salary bill is a million a month, things get a bit stressful. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, you know, a million is this psychological number in people's minds. Um, and, you know, if you're growing a large business and you get to that sort of level, 170 people in nine countries, you're getting wage bills of about that size. And so that means that then you've got uh, business people who, if they've grown up through the agency since it was small, suddenly it's quite scary if they're not used to that idea of seeing that million quid go out every month or million euros in that case. Um, it can, can be very stressful indeed. And so 
when you have then someone offering a big amount of money, let me take that worry away from you. It seems very tempting. And I think this is why uh, actually Americans are better at growing businesses because there's a bit more of that confidence and a bit more of that investment attitude. In Europe, there's more caution. There's more, oh my gosh, I've got all this responsibility for this million pound a month salary. And there's the looking at the, the worry and the stress of that rather than the, hey, we're all together. What can we do now? Let's go and do something great that makes more than this. Um, so I think there needs a bit more gung ho when you're leading an organization and you have that responsibility. You have to know you have that responsibility, but be able to put it a little bit further towards the back of your mind so that what you're focused on is now, how do we really grow this thing? How do we make this profitable? Yeah. Now you end up exiting with a small team that becomes Convivio, your company now, which focused on uh, working with governments, but actually changed focus in 2020 or around the time the, the pandemic uh, switched to helping agency owners. And one of the things I think is really fascinating about you is you had contingency plans and business continuity plans in place in in case of the worst case types of scenarios happening, terrorist attacks and a pandemic. And you actually were starting to plan for that as early as January of 2020. So Take me back to that period of time. Were you watching the news? Did did you kind of see this thing coming, the pandemic, and and figure out that you needed to make some changes? And and what did you do? Yeah, this is one of the the things that caused us to switch other focus of our business because during the pandemic, I suddenly found out that lots of other agencies weren't doing the things that I did in an agency and I felt agencies needed to do, which was that level of strategic thinking and strategic planning, where it is moving beyond being reactive in the day to day to just, oh my gosh, this project's on fire. Oh my God, this client's asking for this. We've got to run around. We've got to be crazy doing these things. Um, uh, and moving even beyond the, gosh, you know, next month's pipeline's looking a bit <laughs> thin. We need to do something. And it's looking even further ahead than that. And so I think that even if you are a sole founder, you need to spend a day, a month uh, being a board member, being a director of your company, taking yourself preferably physically away from everybody and from everything that's going on, disconnecting from the world and really taking the time to think about the, the landscape your business exists in and the strategic issues that might come up. So you would look, for example, at, um, you know, what are the risks that could happen in this business? Now, most governments publish some kind of national risk register. Uh, in the UK, for example, um, a pandemic um, disease has been on the national risk register in the UK since 2008. Um, and every year it's been the top risk above terrorism, above everything else of causing you know, the most threat to the country because it can damage the entire economy. It can lead to many more people being killed than that would be killed in a terrorist attack and so on and so on. So it was the main risk. So therefore, when I was doing my regular planning about risks for the business, um, and then it was an issue. It was a thing we needed to think about. And so what you do is you take, well, this thing could happen in the world, a pandemic, say, and you then look at, well, if that thing happened, what's the risk to our agency? And you bring it close to home. You say, well, the risk to our agency is we won't be able to go to the office or we won't be able to meet with clients or we won't be able to travel or we will have to do everything. You know, And so we'll have to do everything online. And so you begin to plan for, OK, what's that scenario of we can't use the office and we have to work? from home. And that scenario could also be used if the office burns down or if the office is in an area of a major city and a terrorist attack closes that area of the city for a few days. So you, by preparing for one risk, you end up being prepared for many others and you put in place these scenarios. So we, for example, issued all staff with these 4G mobile dongles. We got them to check their home broadband setups. Uh, we did a quick audit of who are the uh, online tech technology providers we rely on uh, and how what do we think their resilience is to some of these scenarios. And we looked at people like Google Apps and Zoom you know, and so on and decided we were fairly confident in their resilience. 
But we have backup plans. So for example, as well as our Zoom account, we have an account with Appearin, uh, which is another video conferencing technology. And of course, by using Google Apps, we have the Google one too. Uh, but uh, it just gave us a range of options where we knew we could have video meetings with people on one platform or another at some stage. So those were all in the plan. Then what happens is because you're aware of the things that could happen, you watch the news and suddenly words click with you. And in sort of late 2019, I saw these very early reports coming out of China of, you know, some mysterious virus and people getting sick and so on. And then on the 11th of January 2020, the first person died, confirmed death from this novel virus. And that's when I knew that something was coming. This matched all the patterns of a potential pandemic. And so we refreshed our plans and we started communicating with clients at that point as well. Um, we started talking to clients and we provided uh, between then in January and March when lockdown happened, we provided training to clients about working from home. We provided some key, key client staff with 4G dongles as well. So that then essentially from day one, we were ready. And we also went into lockdown about a week to 10 days before or the government went into lockdown in the UK um, because we wanted to test the setup while we could still legally meet up if we needed to. We wanted to test everything at that stage. So we activated our plan earlier. So you can make these decisions if you've got this kind of preparation in your back pocket and if you think strategically. And for that, I think you need to have that dedicated time where one day a week you think as the CEO, one day a month you think as a director of the business, looking at bigger, longer term risks and opportunities and trends. And then one day a year, you think as the shareholder. Now, um, you said in 2008, your agency was serving banks during that financial meltdown, which heavily affected you. And one of the big shifts you made then in 2020 was you were serving governments and you shifted, made the decision to shift to agencies. Did you make that decision more quickly because of the experience you'd been through in, in 2008? And also going back now, would you have made that change earlier, shifted to focusing on agencies before the pandemic, knowing what you know now? Knowing what I know yet, uh, yes. And it's always kind of been at the back of my mind. Um, I've always been an absolute business geek. I've loved um, learning about business and talking about business, sharing business, you know, Back in the day, you know, back in 2005, I wrote some business books for Pearson, a big international publisher, and I loved that experience. And I've always, uh, since running an agency, wanted to do more, that is geeking out about agencies and how to run agencies. But it always felt like a bigger leap away. And, you know, I always had a business that was doing well and, uh, you know, I wanted to be running it. Um, so it kind of never quite got done, but I always did lots of mentoring and support of other agencies, um, peer group stuff as well, um, and writing about it. I did a lot of blogging and also I worked on our agency and then I shared publicly what we were doing and other people picked that up as well. So I did a sort of a healthy agency finances framework and I open sourced that and a lot of agencies worldwide have picked that up and are running with it. So I was doing it in a way, but it wasn't the business. Um, then we had this thing going where we were you know, working with governments, particularly the UK government. And that felt like good, solid work. It was productive things. Uh, we've obviously had a change of government in the UK <laughs> in recent years and a change of politics, much as America has been through for four years uh, previously. Yeah. And actually, um, I was going to I was going to mention that as well, because you ended up because of Brexit um, and the risks that that posed to your business, you ended up moving to France. Yeah, that's right. I wanted to create uh, options and I resisted it for a long time because there's a lot involved. You have to do lots of admin. You have to, you know, all that sort of thing. And I had all re responsibilities here. But once we decided to change the direction of the business, that opened up other possibilities, too, and that possibility to be to have more freedom. Um, so the French were very, very generous to us poor Brits who had been subjected to Brexit. 
and they offered us a, a special residency permit that uh, basically, as long as you established some kind of residence in France before the end of 2020, and they included in that list renting an Airbnb, <laughs> um, as long as you establish some kind of residence, you could get this five-year residency permit that would allow you to retain most of your EU rights, the vast majority of them. And that in turn would allow you to then get uh, citizenship in France in five years time if you would continued to meet the criteria. So for the moment, that's giving me options. I've still got the uh, flat in London. In fact, that's where I'm at now, um, uh, hence the small room <laughs> um, uh, packed in a flat in London. Um, uh, and I shuttle back here to do sort of client work and things like that, but then back to France for beautiful walks along the coast and uh, so on. It's gorgeous and great food. Not the worst. Oysters. Oh. You're really, really sacrificing there. I, I can tell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was tough. Yeah. Um, well, I want to wrap things up with the, my gratitude question. I'm a big fan of gratitude, expressing gratitude, especially to peers and, and contemporaries. So, you know, if you look around at your peers, others in your industry, however you want to define that, who do you respect? Who do you admire who's doing good work? Uh, now, I know all your guests always say this, but there's loads and loads and loads. Let's just get that out of the way first. It's like in an Oscar speech. You can't thank everybody uh, or say you admire everybody. But there's one uh, that I would pick out who's another agency owner who I've seen grow their agency and is also making a similar transformation of moving from being a, an agency, a client services agency, to being a product business in their case. Um, and that's Tom Wilmot of Human Made. Um, and he's done it with such um, an incredible uh, approach. I mean, he's the one of the least egotistical people I've met, yet he's achieved loads. And he's so willing to share. I see him, you know, support all sorts of other agency leaders. And he and I meet up and we compare notes and so on. And he's just an absolutely lovely chap, while also having built this really successful long term agency that's now adding to it with a product called Altis. And that's becoming the main bit of their business with the client services part supporting that. Now. So he's made a massive transformation there and done it brilliantly and very successfully. So here's my nomination. That's great. Steve, thanks so much for your time. Where can people go to learn more about you and Agency Raider and Convivo? Convivio, yeah, the best Convivio, place, sorry about that. Yeah, the best place is convivio.com. That's C-O-N-V-I-V-I-O.com. And uh, just briefly before we finish, John, the, the word convivio, I must tell you about it because it's brilliant. It just encapsulates the soul of our business. Uh, convivio is an Italian word, and it, it captures the spirit for Italians of being around a big table with family and friends sharing good food and good conversation. Um, and that's how we want our business to feel. And that's how we think agency businesses that are run well really can feel. So we love the word convivio. That's great. Yeah, very good name. Great, great word for a name for a business. Well, Steve, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast. <laughs>